Lufia 2 is one hell of a game with a lot of additional content besides the main storyline and in this video I will show you an effective way to beat the most difficult side quest, the Ancient Cave. This is really no easy task because in this roguelike dungeon you not only start as a party of level 1 characters but you also face the hardest enemies the whole game has to offer. And the final boss battle down on the 99th floor is a little bit special so you need the right equipment and strategy to defeat him. Otherwise you have to start all over again. But even if Arwen Jesus was not smiling down on you there is still a glitch that you can use to effortlessly win the battle and get the rewards. Hey I'm your guide Toby and this is Toby Continued. One thing that I really like about RPGs is that they often come with various side content. From additional quests to optional dungeons or even secret and challenging super bosses, almost every RPG features something that you can enjoy besides the main storyline. And one of the coolest and hardest side quests is the ancient cave in Lufia 2. If you ever played a roguelike game before, you already know the rules. Every time you enter the cave, your character's level is set back to 1 and you lose all of your current items and equipment. You basically enter the cave as naked as God created you, with the exception of 10 potions. I guess they forgot to mention that in Genesis 127. Inside you have to fight through 98 randomly generated floors and your characters will naturally gain experience by defeating enemies in ever increasing difficulty. You will also gain items, spells and equipment in chests that you find on your way. But here is the kicker. There are two different kinds of chests, red ones and blue ones. The overwhelming majority of chests are red and you will lose the items you find inside when you exit the cave. Whereas you keep the items from blue chests and can take them into the outside world. And those items can be extremely powerful. To make things even better, you can also take those items back into the cave the next time you go in. But there is a catch. You will only keep the items you found in blue chests if you exit the cave by using an item called Providence that you can find between floor 20 and 29. If you exit the cave by getting wiped from the floor however, you also lose the items you found in blue chests. So the idea is to fight your way through the cave at least until you get Providence. And if you feel like enemies are getting too strong, you leave the cave and try again with an ever increasing arsenal of blue chest items that will make you more and more powerful. It's a neat gameplay cycle with an additional bonus that it also makes you more powerful for the rest of the game. But the way down the cave is extremely challenging and the biggest factor for success is not the amount of blue chest items that you already have, but the party setup and strategy that you employ. In fact, it is totally possible to get down in your very first attempt if you know what you're doing. Which you will if you watch this video to the end. And if you go the extra mile and subscribe to my channel, you will also make sure to get all the tips and tricks for my future uploads. So let's talk about your characters first. There are two possible setups that are of interest, which consist of Maxim, Guy and Seelan and then either Dika or Artia. If you go in with Dika, which is only possible for a limited time during your playthrough, you have the best chance to defeat the final boss if you manage to reach him. But if you go in much later during your playthrough with Arti instead, you have an easier life descending to the bottom. The main difference is that Arti is a very fast character with high agility while Dika is the slowest character overall. It basically boils down to this. You have to be effective in battle and preserve your resources and having a high agility party means two things. One, you can get rid of some enemies even before they have a chance to attack you and two, you can scout enemies. Scouting means that you can get into a fight and if you don't like the enemy lineup, you can choose to flee from a battle with a 100% escape chance before the enemy has a chance to attack. But this only works when all of your characters have higher agility than the enemy. So if you have Dika with you, it will not work all the time and often only after the enemy made the first move. Scouting is super useful and essential to safely get through the last 20 floors because regardless of your character's equipment and level, the enemies there will always be able to defeat you with a couple of turns. So for the sake of this video, I will now assume that your party consists of Maxim, Guy, Seelan and Artie, but the general idea of getting high agility also applies for other setups. 
Oh, and by the way, if you play through the whole game and an additional time in New Game Plus, you will get the opportunity to start the game in Gift Mode, which brings you directly to the cave and you can then freely choose your party setup. It's an awesome addition if you want to get into the cave over and over with different characters, but I will not further discuss this option. Now let's talk about items and spells. When I said that the first time you enter the cave you are naked as God created you, I was not 100% honest because there are a couple of special blue chest items that you can find during your regular playthrough and you can take those into the cave as well. The items in question are Gates Blade which you can get by defeating Gates and Gordovan and a couple of jewels that you can get as loot from certain enemies. I have a guide on my channel on how to defeat Gates so check that out if you haven't already. His blade not only gives you a nice boost early on, but it is also really good against the most powerful enemies the cave has to offer. And in addition, it is essential if you want to beat the boss. In terms of jewels, the only ones that you want are twist jewels, which you can get by defeating Bwin's lizards in the Divine Shrine. I would even go as far and say that those jewels are the most important items because they give you a whopping 30 points in agility and that is huge. If every one of your party members has one of these jewels equipped, you are guaranteed to have the speed advantage against most enemies, given that you are not desperately underleveled. In terms of heal spells, anything will do, but ideally you would like to have Valor for big heals and revives, and Stronger or Champion for cost effectiveness. It's not mandatory though, I was able to get down with just a week as strong heal, you then just have to remember that healing during fights is really not that helpful. Also, pay close attention to the equipment that you find because some armor pieces can have powerful healing abilities to support you in times of need. In addition to some healing, you also want a way to restore your mana points. Without mana, no spells, and without spells you will have a hard time keeping your party alive. The best way to ensure a healthy supply is to steal from others, just like in real life, which you can do by finding the absorb spell. If you get it, you are golden, if you don't, you are in for a hard time. But thankfully there are some items that can help you out as well. One is the bat walk that you can get as loot from bat enemies including some of the vampires. The walk has the absorb spell as an IP ability so definitely kill all bats that you encounter because even one walk can keep your mana pool up and running. Just equip it when a character runs low and seek out an enemy to leech on. Other items are the Silver Armor and Mail, which have an IP ability that restores 25% of a character's mana points. That might not seem like much, but in combination with the other consumables, it can sustain you throughout the whole cave. Other important items are weapons which have a chance to instantly kill enemies. Their stats might not be that good, but oh boy let me tell you, that one deadly sword that I found and accidentally equipped on Maxim carried me through the whole one. Seriously, at first I was kind of annoyed because I didn't find a gas lifter to unequip the sword, but the deeper I went into the cave the more I realized that the chance to instantly kill enemies is much higher than I initially thought. They are super effective as long as enemies are not immune to dark damage and the best way to deal with most of the beefy late game monsters which are a pain to grind down otherwise. I cannot stress how much that sword saved my ass, but I would prefer to have Seelan be equipped with a deadly wad, or even better, the fatal pick, which has a whopping 80% chance to instantly kill an enemy on hit. And for those enemies who are immune to dark damage, Seelan can then either restore her mana, heal the party, use IP abilities or simply attack with magic. Oh and by the way, I would avoid using any other cursed weapons, especially the berserk blade because cursed lifters are not that common and if Guy for example is stuck with a cursed blade, you will not only soon face problems against many undead enemies but ultimately also at the end against the boss. However, there are tons of other useful items. For example, Hidora Walks, the Myth Blade or Old Sword and the Twig Spell are very important to beat the boss, whereas a strong fire based weapon is useful to exploit monster weaknesses because it's effective against water, ice, plants and some undead enemies like skeletons and ghouls. But if you find any other strong elemental weapon or the lizard blow against wagons, definitely save it for later. In case of the used capsule monster, there are pros and cons to each of them and it might come down to your personal preference. Flash can help you with healing and is good during the early one to fill up your hit points, especially if you don't have a healing spell. 
However, I would choose Darby the Dark Capsule Monster for three reasons. 1. His last forms have some awesome abilities. 2. His dark attribute makes him powerful against the strongest kind of enemy near the end of the cave. And 3. He does not defend that often, unlike Sully for example, which is a huge bonus for the boss battle. The biggest con against him is certainly that he tends to flee when damaged and that his dark attribute makes him not so effective against many undead enemies during the middle part of the cave. But I think the pros heavily outweigh the cons and especially once he reaches class 3, his attacks can be super helpful. Speaking of which, I even prefer to leave him at class 3 because in this form he has access to the destruction spell which is a useful instant kill ability. I would still develop him at least to class 4 and let him learn the evil aura first, but then switch back to class 3 for the rest of the one until reaching the boss. From here on I will divide the descent into 3 groups of around 30 floors and describe the most challenging enemies in each section and give you some additional tips before we get into the boss fight. The first 20 floors are not that hard, especially if you have gate blade and twist jewels as the jewels also give you 30 points in defense and gate blade one shots everything except the skeletons. Loot all chests that you can find, which goes for the whole cave in general, but I wouldn't say it's required to beat every enemy. The experience they give is negligible in the bigger picture, so it's totally fine to skip some fights and save time. Which of course does not mean you should skip most of them. For example, I would avoid the annoying wisps and wingers, because those are the only enemies that are faster than your characters. Make sure to find providence between floor 21 and 30. You should feel that the enemy's difficulty is gaining some traction and from now on you should seek out as many fights as you can. You will also notice that gate blade becomes less and less important as enemies with dark immunity get more prominent. So at some point it might be a good idea to replace the blade with something else, even if it has less attack power. As mentioned earlier, I would suggest something fire based because fire is effective against many of the undead ghoul and skeletal enemies. Another useful element at this point is ice because it's effective against the deadly swords and armor, skull lizards, sand golems and pugs. Oh and get familiar distinguishing between mimics and real chests. The mimics look somewhat brighter <laughs> and especially the blue ones are hard to beat. But if you didn't get any good equipment or spells, you can also end the one early once you found providence and try again, hopefully with some additional blue chest items. The decision is up to you, it's definitely possible to get much deeper into the cave with no healing and you are likely to find something sooner or later. But you can of course repeatedly go through the first 30 floors until you found the items that guarantee success. Below floor 30 it's really starting to get interesting. Here you will face many undead enemies, so being able to do light damage is extremely helpful. If you have a way to restore mana and found the Sizzle or Fry spell, Arty can take out many enemies in advance. For me, one of the worst foes are the Assassins and later the upgraded Ninjas. You can hardly avoid them because they move much faster and they also have high agility and will likely go first in battle. Both have an insta kill ability which works more often than you would like to and you will have to use some of your miracles or revive items if you don't have the appropriate spell. The assassins are weak to light damage though so you can take advantage of that but ninjas have no elemental weaknesses and in addition they get 2 attacks per turn and can throw knives to severely damage your entire team. If you want to make things easier hide in the doorway before entering a room and swing your sword to lure them out. If they take the bait and are positioned sideways in front of you, you might get a preemptive strike. Then wear them down as fast as you can. Another annoying class of enemies are the bone and iron golems, both having incredibly high defense. They don't do that much damage, but they are hard to take down. Bone golems are weak to thunder and hard weapons like watts, but iron golems have no elemental weakness at all. This is where weapons with a chance to instantly kill start to shine. Just make sure that the character who has such a weapon equipped attacks one golem and the other three focus on another. Taking advantage and being aware of enemy weaknesses will start to have a big impact on your performance, so always try to memorize what works and what doesn't. Dark Skulls, Necromancers, Assassins and Hades Skulls are weak to light damage for example, while Armor Dates take extra damage from flying weapons like bows and Tangus are weak to ice, so plan ahead and equip accordingly. 
Below level 50, enemies are getting really beefy. You will face less undeads eventually and I really advise you to start using insta-kill mechanics and be aware of enemy weaknesses. If you haven't done so before, feed your capsule monster any access items and get it to class 4. You can harvest the wizards on floor 50 to 52 for some extra experience by dragging out the battle and defeating the companions they call. They are all weak to light damage and worth more than 2000 experience so if you are confident feel free to spend as much time as you want. I am not an advocate for it though. If you are short on mana in general, avoid the wizards and also the Nosferatu and vampire combinations as they tend to suck out your mana. Fiends are slow but they can cast perish and attack twice per turns so attack them with light based weapons. They can drop an evil jewel if you are lucky which is cursed but increases your attack by a whopping 120. I would either equip it on Arty, who has enough agility to compensate for losing out on the twist jewel or save it for the final boss where agility does not matter. Sly Foxes and Savachos are both enemies with high agility and 2 or even 3 attacks per turn who can dish out some major damage, but they are both susceptible to flying weapons. Sly Foxes are in addition weak to thunder. Sea Hidoras attack all party members and High Hidoras have a staggering 5 single attacks each turn which can spell trouble. But they are weak to ice and it's easy to get behind them for a surprise attack. You want to fight every Hidora that you find because they can drop the Hidora walk with a triple attack IP ability which is super useful for the boss and you definitely want one. Salamander and White Dragons are very similar just with the opposite elemental attunement. They have both high agility and strong AoE abilities but are weak against flying weapons and their respective counter element. So use fire against white dragons and water or ice against salamanders. Gold golems are also a pain. They have high hit points, defense and no weakness and unlike the earlier golems they can dish out heavy damage with their golden mist attack. If no enemy so far was persistent and threatening enough to convince you to use insta kill abilities, these little bastards will surely do. But it's also easy to get a surprise attack on them as they will stay in place and rotate clockwise when you are 5 or more blocks away. They only move when they directly face you which means once they rotate a quarter turn away you can just walk up to them and get a 100% preemptive strike. It's super effective. Now from floor 67 onwards you will face leeches which are one of the most dangerous enemies overall. They will most likely go first, get 2 attacks each turn, can inflict status effects such as sleep or confusion, have strong offensive spells and even instant kill abilities. The only good news is that they just have over 500 hit points and are weak to light damage. And thank god it is also easy to get a preemptive strike as they only move every 3 steps you take and they like to teleport when you are farther away. They will indicate where they appear after teleporting and keep facing the same direction which is your opportunity to sneak up from behind. Of course you will face the strongest enemies on the last 30 floors. Most battles from now on will be a royal pain so exploiting weaknesses and getting preemptive strikes is more important than ever. Now let's take a look at the most dangerous monsters the cave has to offer. Orkies have 2800 hit points and attack 8 times each turn, which means if you face 2 of them and fail to take out 1 in the first round, you have to take 16 hits in a row which is scary as fuck. They are weak to thunder, anti-dragon weapons like the lizard blow and of course insta kill abilities. An additional tip is to use sleep or paralyze effects from sleep or freeze balls or the coma spell if you found it. I haven't seen the effect failing once and controlling one orky while pounding the other makes the fight a lot easier. Another pesky class of enemies are the elemental genies. They use powerful spells and can drain your mana which makes the fight against them more stressful than it's worth. 
The good news is that they tend to waste turns defending and you can use the same trick from the gold golems to get a preemptive strike. Then use their respective elemental weakness to defeat them. Arch fiends are deadly. They have two actions per turn with strong physical attacks and a powerful thunder and destroy spell and have much more hit points than leeches. And to make things worse, you cannot get a sneak attack on them, so use light based attacks to defeat them fast. The only really good news is that they are also susceptible to instant kill effects and you hopefully have one such weapon available. When dark summoners start to summon additional monsters like Hades or leeches, things can quickly get out of hand, especially because they can do this twice each turn. In addition, they can cast Parish and Dark Aura and have an agility of 3 fucking hundred, which means no matter what you do, they will act first. Focus them down with light based weapons and spells as fast as you can, otherwise you will face an endless amount of reinforcements. Of course the developers saved the best for last, so from level 80 on and until the very end you will face the infamous copper, silver and gold dragons. These metallic assets hold the record for prematurely ending people's lives. They all have similar stats of around 2500 hit points, over 300 defense and around 140 agility and their main difference is the amount of actions they get, with copper getting 1, silver getting 2 and gold getting a frightening 3 attacks each turn. These can be simple physical attacks, offensive and defensive spells and a powerful signature ability which totally blasts your shoes off. Silver and gold dragons are weak to dark weapons such as Gatesblade, while all three dragons are in addition weak against dragon specific weapons like the Lizard Blow and of course instant kill abilities. To be honest, if you don't have one deadly weapon equipped, preferably the Fatal Pick for Sealan, you will have a really hard time fighting any combination of silver or gold dragons. Now this is the moment where you will truly appreciate your high agility party setup, because with the twist jewels equipped every character, even guy, should be faster than the dragons are, meaning that you can safely scout and escape battles if you don't like the enemy composition or how the fight goes. But first off, always try and get a preemptive strike. If you don't get it and it's a bad combination of at least one gold or two silver dragons, escape from battle and try again. If it's two gold dragons, do yourself a favor and avoid them or destroy both dragons with insta deaths in one turn. The character with the deadly weapon should always try to take the most dangerous dragon out in the preemptive round. The rest focuses on the other one. Ideally, you only want one damaged copper or silver dragon standing after your first round, so you can take him out safely during the second round before he has a chance to attack, but even if he does, one or two attacks will not wipe you out. Following this strategy got me through the last 20 floors without any issues and I got very confident and earned tons of experience for the boss battle. If your capsule monster is Darby, his dark element will be an additional boon, so after a while I was more terrified by the dark summoners than the dragons themselves. If you manage to survive and reach the 99th floor, you are rewarded with the most beautiful scenery the game has to offer, which is a garbled mess of pixels. Oh yeah, the visual bug that you saw in the room with the dual blade also exists in the last floor of the ancient cave. At least if you are playing the NTSC version. In the PAL version, everything looks fine. Thankfully you only have to walk straight north to encounter your last challenge. Yep, it's a wet jelly only 10 times bigger. But don't let his tender texture fool you, he is called the master for a reason and the fight is not easy. But it also doesn't work in the way that you would expect. Unlike other fights where you have to kill the boss before he kills you, the ball of goop doesn't even attack in the first place, instead he heals you during the first and second round. What a nice guy. Now the problem is that in order to win you have to defeat the blob within 3 rounds, after which he simply runs off. And if that happens, you lost the fight. You can then still use providence and exit the cave with all the blue chest items that you found, but you won't get the 3 reward chests and have to make another one through the whole cave to try again. Now imagine, if you will, the face of a 10 year old Toby finally reaching the bottom of the cave after countless attempts just to see the final boss jerking off after 3 rounds and leaving the stage. I mean. Nobody told him beforehand how the fight works and there was no awesome guy on YouTube providing tips and guides for video games. 
Anyway, so the boss fight is what you would call a DPS race in other games and you have to dish out 10,000 damage in 3 rounds before he escapes. And that's also the reason why having Dika in your party almost guarantees success, because the Dika blade, which only appears in red chests inside the cave and can only be worn by him, has an IP ability that damages the enemy for 50% of his current hit points. Therefore, if you use the ability early during the fight, you immediately take 5000 hit points from the boss's health pool. Combine this with an Octo Strike from Gate's Blade, preferably after one or two trick spells, and the boss is almost dead already. But if you don't have Dika in your party, winning this battle is tricky and depends heavily on the items you found during your descent. Of course we are looking for anything that can dish out high damage numbers and there are a couple of essential items and spells. The most important one is Gate's Blade because of the aforementioned Octo Strike and hopefully you got this weapon as a reward for beating Gates in Godavan or found it inside a blue chest inside the cave. Otherwise, I wouldn't even bother to try and beat the boss legitimately and skip forward to the section where I explain how you can use a glitch to win in another way. However, there are other items with IP abilities which take a fixed fraction of the enemy's hit points, namely the Myth Blade or Old Sword and Gorgon Rocks, although they are all weaker than Dika's Blade. The Twig spell is important as well to increase your attack power during your first round and strangely it also works with items that take a fixed percentage of the enemy hit points. Hidora rocks are another good source of damage because they have a weaker version of the Octo Strike which is still better than using normal attacks or spells. Some powerful weapons from blue chests like the Fire and Sky Sword also have abilities where you strike all enemies and then follow it up with a strong magic spell. So if you have one of those, use them as well. Oh and by the way, this is also the reason why Darby is a good choice as your capsule monster because unlike Sully for example, he doesn't choose to defend during his turn and will likely dish out some good damage. But make sure to use him in his 4th or master class because you don't want him to use a destroy spell and waste a turn. Now the first thing you should do after entering the final floor is making sure that every party member has a 100% filled IP bar, for obvious reasons. The boss jelly does not attack you and if you do not have enough IP points, well, skip ahead to the part with a glitch. To make sure that your IP bar is filled, you can search for an easy combination of Metal Dragon on floor 98, ideally just one copper, and leave that enemy for last. Then just exploit him by letting him attack you while defending and healing yourself until everyone's IP bar is filled. You don't need any defense, so equip everything that increases your attack power, especially evil jewels if you found one. Guy should take Gate's Blade, Maxim gets a weapon which takes a fraction of the enemy hit points, preferably the Myth Blade, but if you don't have any of those, he gets the weapon with the strongest attack and IP ability. Seelin and RT ideally each have a Hidora walk. The order in which your characters act are likely RT, Seelin, Maxim and then Guy. So in your first round both RT and Seelin should start by casting a trick spell on all characters, giving your whole party a 20 and then 10% increase to their attack power. Then Maxim unleashes his fractional IP ability and Guy uses a normal attack. Before doing anything during your second round, move Artie and Sealand to the front row because now they will use their IP abilities, which should ideally be a triple attack or any strong ability and being in the first row makes the physical attacks more powerful. Maxim can then either do a normal attack or use the trick spell a third time for another 5% increase to your attack power, followed up by another normal attack from Guy. In the third and last round, put Maxim and Guy in front again and RT, Seelan and Maxim all use physical attacks while Guy unleashes his fully pumped up Octo Strike, which hopefully kills off the jelly. And pray that your capsule monster helps out as well. But you might not have the necessary items to kill the master jelly at the end of the ancient cave in Lufia 2 and if you are missing the essentials like Gates Blade, a good weapon with a fractional IP ability, the Twig Spell and one or two Hidora Rocks, you might be better off relying on another way to end the fight in 3 rounds. 
for that, unequip everything except your most powerful weapons and kill your characters within 3 rounds. Without any armor, this shouldn't be hard to accomplish, just have your casters use their strongest spells on your whole party and your fighters can then take care of the rest, including themselves. This ends the fight and the Master Jelly acts as if you defeated him, giving you the reward key. Then just use Providence and exit the cave pretending to have beaten the Jelly the real way. Now that was a whole lot to cover. I know that there are tons of other tips and tricks that experts could give, but for me, the stuff that I mentioned totally worked out. If you know anything that is missing, please tell me and others in the comments below. I hope I could help you to finally beat the cave and if I did, a like would be highly appreciated and feel free to check out my channel for more tips and tricks on video games. And always remember that this is Toby Continued.